Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel, I'm Rob and today we'll be jumping into malicious compliance. Before we start please hit that subscribe button and click the notification bell so you know when the next video goes live. Our first story today comes to us from Nothing Beast. So you're the manager of my spare time now? Let's jump right in. I was employed at a small market radio station for many years a while back. I loved the actual work, but the people there were just terrible, particularly the manager in this story. She spent seven years pretending we were friends, working up from sales to sales manager and eventually station manager. And then one day, she decided to make my job a completely miserable experience, holding station meetings without me, Creating recording sessions without putting them on my schedule, ignoring my reports of tech issues so things never got fixed. It was ridiculous how little managing she actually did. Basically, there had been a buildup of her crap leading up to this story, and this was the first real time I put my foot down. Since we were a small staff and I was the employee with the most years, I had a lot of responsibilities. The easiest way of describing my job was I did everything except sell ads. Every day had the same main responsibilities, but minor changes kept each day different. Punch in at 8 a.m. and co-host the final hour of the morning show, answer phones and the door all day, record ads and clients, edit shows, do the afternoon broadcast 1 to 5 p.m., pre-record the evening news block to air after I leave for the day. One day the morning show host decided we needed to talk about America's Got Talent. But by the time he has this great idea, auditions were already three shows in. I had never watched the show before because I absolutely hated reality TV. But I thought, what could it hurt? And I went home that night to watch the week four episode. While it was entertaining, it was also an overly padded waste of time. But I did my homework and did the show the next morning, and hyped it up like it was the greatest thing ever. Next week, I forgot to watch. I go in to work, and the morning show host asks what I thought, and I panic for a second, before telling him I didn't see it. Since I had about 20 minutes of morning news before I was live, I ran to my office and checked YouTube for a highlight reel. And there it was, an hour-long TV show whittled down to a 15-minute video. Perfect. When it was done, I moved to the broadcast studio and did a great recap of last night's episode. Even the host, who watched the entire show, thought I did a great job keeping up with him. Sixth episode came around and this time I remembered it was on, but since I knew NBC was going to post the highlights for me tomorrow, I opted to spend my free time on something that I actually wanted to do. Next morning, I go straight to the highlight reel and get caught up on every act that was important enough to talk about. Again, the show host thought I did a great job, but my manager didn't think it was good enough. She called me into her office to ask why I was purposely ignoring requests to watch the show. I asked her what difference does it make whether I watch the hour-long broadcast, full of commercials and long-winded filler to stretch the runtime, versus watching the highlight reel that has every high point and does the same job in 15 minutes. She said it makes a difference and wouldn't elaborate. She was always pulling that I'm right and don't have to tell you why crap. She then pointed out that next week was when the judges began cutting acts and there was going to be episodes every Tuesday and Wednesday for the rest of the broadcast and watching it was mandatory. How long are these episodes? I asked her. They're an hour each, and that's when I decided to put an end to this BS once and for all. So that's two hours of show prep each week. Do I mark that down on my timesheet as overtime, or am I expected to cut out at 3 p.m. on Fridays so I don't go over my scheduled 40 hours? My manager's eyes bugged out like she never once expected me to demand payment for dictating how I spend my time outside of the office. I just stood there waiting to see if I was going to be making extra money or getting an early start to the weekend. Suddenly, the 15-minute highlight reel during regular paid office hours was good enough. Funny how that works, eh? This just sounds like another uneducated manager doing the I need to be in control because I'm in charge BS. 
I don't think I would have said anything. I think I just would have added it to my timesheet and handed it in. Our second story today comes to us from Rock Machine. No overtime and report actual time worked? Regional manager steps on my toes. Let's jump right in. Many years ago, I was managing a company that was part of a national chain. We served customers all over the world with internet, phone, and we also had a high volume of walk-in customers on site. My regional manager made it clear to me that I was not to authorize any overtime. If a customer walked in or called in a few minutes before closing and would require an employee to work over 30 to 60 minutes to service the customer and make a sale, I would allow them to come in late the next day by the 30 or 60 minutes they had worked over the night before. I balanced the time every week with no overtime and reported regular hours on payroll. We were working a bi-monthly pay period. One day when I was off, the regional manager paid a surprise visit to the site I was managing. He had a meeting with all the employees in my absence and read them the riot act and demanded that all of them must report promptly in the morning at the start of their shift and leave in the same manner at the end of the shift and they must report actual times on the handwritten time cards to the minute. My team reports this to me the following day, and we comply. We rack up a bunch of overtime over the next two weeks, with those that got caught up servicing customers at the end of the day after hours. After submitting the timesheets, the regional manager calls me and goes off on me about the overtime. It went like this. What the hell is going on over there? I told you no overtime. This is unacceptable. I didn't authorize this. Did you visit my facility and have a meeting with my staff in my absence and demand that actual times must be reported and they have to be punctual and leave promptly? Yes, I did. I have been managing this by allowing people to work late and come in late to eliminate overtime and make sales. We close at 5. We expect a sales rep to answer the phone at 4.59, work with the customer, and make a sale. If a customer walks in at 4.59, we expect a sales rep to work with the customer and make a sale. This could take 15 minutes to an hour. I appreciate my staff doing this to service the customer, and we are now complying with your new rule to report actual times. You really shook up my staff on your last visit, and I cannot manage this anymore. Forget we had this conversation and go back to what you were doing. Well, in this case, at least when the manager realized that he'd made a mistake, he didn't double down on stupid. This is actually the sign of a pretty good manager when they can realize they did something wrong and adapt pretty quickly. Our next story comes to us from Yuki1999. Won't let me delay my speech because I'm ill? No problem. Let's jump right in. Another post reminded me of this story, and to this day, I still regret not reporting my professor for this. A few years ago, in my second year of college, I took a speech class that was required to graduate. Before this incident, I had no problems with the professor. I had the highest grade in the class, and all my conversations with her had been pleasant. Then, Thanksgiving break happens. I leave to go home for the week and come down with a nasty illness. I was later diagnosed with a sinus infection, an ear infection, and bronchitis all at the same time. Don't want to give details, but it was bad. Knowing that I had to give my final speech for this class on the Tuesday after break, I emailed my professor explaining just how ill I was and asked if I could give my speech on Thursday instead of Tuesday. Half the class was going on Tuesday, the other on Thursday, so I figured that this wouldn't be a problem. The professor emails back and says that I have two options. Show up to class sick on Tuesday and give my speech as I am, or go to the doctor on Tuesday, get a doctor's note, then do my speech on Thursday. But if I did this option, my grade would be deducted for missing class, as well as she would give me a maximum of a B for my speech instead of an A. Based on the language of her email, she clearly expected me to go to the doctor and miss class, dropping my grade. Cue the malicious compliance. Tuesday rolls around and I show up to class in my full business attire, but with the addition of tissues, cough drops, and a plastic bag. I get up to give my speech and my illness is in full swing. I could tell that she looked disgusted, and at this point, 
clearly regretted telling me that I had to come to class. She very clearly did not think I was as sick as I was and thought that I was just looking to BS her to get an extension. This professor was certainly proved wrong that day. After class gets out, I finally go to the doctor, learn that I have the trifecta, sinus infection, ear infection, and bronchitis, get scolded by the doctor for going to class the day before, and get told not to attend class for the rest of the week. Professor ended up giving me an A on the assignment and never gave me any trouble about late assignments because of my illness for the rest of the semester. Okay, was anyone else hoping this was going to end with OP throwing up all over the front of the classroom or even on the professor's desk for a little bit of added points? Our next story today comes from Barbecue in Hell. I should let my wet t-shirt dry on chair because I'm five minutes late. Okay, have fun with HR. Let's jump right in. A little background. Back in 2017, I was working on a call center for a telecommunications company. I was almost three years there and the job had gone from okay to okay-ish to crappy in six months. The company did a lot of things that pissed most of us and led to a few malicious compliances and revenges. In six months, we had four different managers and ten shift managers. The second to last before I bolted and one of the protagonists of the story was a real piece of crap. He was a racist, misogynistic, homophobic tyrant with a big ego. Let's call him Kevin. He was the kind of manager that would try to micromanage your call log, how many incoming and outgoing you had, how many customer supports, how many sales, and if you didn't hit your dailies, would shout at you. If you were late, you would have to work the same amount, and if it was more than 10 minutes, would dock an hour of your pay. The other protagonist and malicious compliancer was Mary. Mary was a good-looking woman on her late 30s, with 20 years of experience in call centers and a no-nonsense attitude. As you may understand, Mary and Kevin didn't like each other very much, but the incident that got the ball rolling happened on Pride Week. Mary was wearing a Pride shirt in support of her lesbian daughter. Kevin said a few sexist and homophobic things, and they almost came to physical blows. HR intervened, but that seemed to galvanize Kevin, and after that day, he tried to make her life difficult every day. The incident. I was working the first shift, 7 to 1500, on a Friday of early July. The weather was good until 1130, when it suddenly darkened and a heavy rain started falling. As the second shift, 12 to 20, started coming in, we noticed most of them were running a bit late. Heavy rain interfered with traffic, and wet to the bone. Most of them did a beeline to the bathroom to try to dry themselves with paper towels. Mary steps in at 12.05, looking like a drowned rat, and starts to go to the bathroom to dry herself. Kevin notices her and stops her. The following, very loud, almost shouting conversation followed. Where do you think you're going? To the bathroom to dry my t-shirt? You're late. You can go to the bathroom during your break. I'm soaking wet. I don't want to work with a wet shirt. I need to dry it down. I don't give a crap. You're late. You have to start working. But my shift, I do not care. You are late. You can let it dry on the chair while working. Cue malicious compliance. While most of us were a bit stunned by the whole exchange, Mary walks purposefully to her station fires up the app, and removes her t-shirt and puts it on the back of the chair to dry. Now, Mary is a well-endowed woman, and sitting there wearing only her bra is attracting a lot of attention. She had calmly put her headset on and already doing a call. To HR, Kevin being Kevin is the last one to notice a half-naked woman making calls. He goes and stands menacing behind her. What the F do you think you're doing? Mary on the phone. I did exactly what he told me. No, I don't feel comfortable at all. Answer me, you bitch. Did I mention his lovely personality? And pulls her headset off, unplugging in the process. The phones we used had a quirk that if the headset unplugs, it turns the speaker on. Did he just call you a bitch? Yes, he did. Who the F are you? HR, we'll be there in a few minutes. 
Kevin lost all his color as the speaker hung up. In about 10 minutes, HR had arrived to find a properly cowed Kevin, Mary covering her legs with a beach towel, courtesy of a colleague who planned to visit the beach after the shift, and wearing a Man o' War t-shirt while her own was still on the back of her chair, and a half-naked me. I provided the t-shirt. The Aftermath Before HR arrived, Mary had made one more call to the union. After interviewing everybody, Mary and Kevin were allowed to go home. Kevin was fired after two days. The delay outraged the union, who caused a fuss, and the next time something happened, they came down like a megaton of bricks on the company. Mary had collected evidence, including this one, and when the company tried to fire her, she sued and won a nice settlement. So basically, Kevin was a walking, talking lawsuit waiting to happen. It was only a matter of time before somebody like OP's co-worker decided to maliciously comply, do exactly as Kevin said, and take the last little bit of dirt out of the grave that he'd already dug for himself. Thank you to all four OPs for posting their stories in the Malicious Compliance subreddit. They are linked in the description below. Please go check them out. Check out one of these other videos. And if you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories.